Tariq, welcome back. So what part of Larry Fink's message do you most struggle with? There's a lot of things I struggle with in that message, but I think he's almost setting up a fake fight by pretending to defend against, you know, people who are criticizing woke capitalism. If that criticism is coming from the right, then I can tell people on the right that, you know, I sat at the middle of this. That you don't have to worry about anything. It's all marketing and PR for the most part. And it actually doesn't achieve any progressive ends at all beyond sort of uh, defending the status quo for longer and preventing the kind of systemic reforms led by government that are actually going to be required to address the climate crisis. So you're, in other words, you agree with the ends that Fink talks about, you know, the idea of sustainable investing, the purpose, the, the point, it's just the means. You don't think that a lot of the current investments are doing much to change the status quo. And you think that he's kind of over-promising, maybe sucking people into the funds and not delivering on those promises? I would agree with him on what he says in principle, which is that we need to do something to address climate change and inequality and a whole set of pressing social issues that most people will tell you that we can't leave unsolved for much longer. Where I disagree is on the how, right? Sustainable investing, for the most part, is just marketing and PR. All it serves to do, the, you know, the idea of stakeholder capitalism if you apply that to a competitive sport, it would be like saying that the answer, you know, to a game that has devolved into dirty play because players are focused on scoring points and it turns out playing dirty helps them score points. The answer would be good sportsmanship, right, and self-refereeing. That's obviously not the answer. The answer is mandatory compliance, not voluntary compliance, particularly when you have a market failure and a set of issues where companies actually profit from doing things that are not in the public interest. And so by droning on about stakeholder capitalism and a set of ideas that I can tell you make absolutely no sense in practice and aren't what our experts are recommending from an economic perspective, you know, there, there's a real danger because we don't just kick the can down the road on mm -hmm. climate action, right? We've seen the last few years ESG words and assets are increasing and they increase alongside, you know, in, in emissions and inequality and all the things they're meant to do something about because they actually, there's no link between them. But the biggest concern I have is that not only are we endangering the planet by you know, wasting time now on when we know that prevention beats cure, you know, we're also endangering the political foundations of capitalism, right? I'm a capitalist. I think that the system that we need is a well-managed capitalism that actually allows us to build and scale so, the innovation required for decarbonization. And right now, the majority of people younger than me don't believe in capitalism because they're hearing this blah, blah, blah from leaders that, you know, stakeholder capitalism is the answer when it's obviously not. Well, I, I, I want to say a couple of things. One, it doesn't, it doesn't make any difference, but I happen to share your view that there's an awful lot about ESG investing that feels to me like smart marketing, like a nice wrapper around things. And, and when you ask people who are in charge of sustainable investing at various funds and you ask them directly, is Facebook uh, a, a legitimate um, candidate for your portfolios? Is Google? Are the companies with dual share class structures? Are they exemplars of good governance? Uh, they will dance all around it until the cows come home. But be that as it may, if you disagree that that capitalism can be the solution here, you you would have to say then, I, I assume that government action would then have to take the place and be the solution. But that sure doesn't, like a carbon tax or um, lots of more, lots more, that sure doesn't look like it is going to happen. So are you caught in a catch-22 where the capitalism won't be the solution and government action can't be the solution, and so you're left with nothing? Well, so I, I would take issue with the premise of the question because it implies that capitalism and government action are mutually exclusive. To be clear, no capitalist system or market exists without rules being enforced by government in the same way that no basketball game can possibly exist without the NBA setting up rules and enforcing them through referees. The debate we're having is simply around whether we're going to rely on good sportsmanship, right, which is effectively the market will self-correct because players decide that suddenly, you know, social purpose is something that they're very focused on and they decide to do the right thing over the long term themselves, you know, net zero voluntary commitments, net zero by 2050, um, you know, or are we going to rely on what our experts are telling us is that, you know, purpose and profit don't overlap. The only thing that makes sense if we want to avoid a situation where CEOs have to decide between playing clean and losing or playing dirty and winning is that the referees start to close some of those loopholes. So my question to Larry Fink and the other signatories of the business roundtable 
would be that if our experts are saying systemic reforms are led by systemic you know, actions by government, not to replace capitalism, but to catalyze the private sector, exactly like Operation Warp Speed, which he mentions in his letter today, then how are you helping the government to do that, right? Think of COVID-19. We flattened the curve through government action because you had to close places, make masks mandatory, and then you galvanized the, pri the private sector by, you know, direct R&D, pre-orders, and other things that allowed the private sector's best incent incentives and the best minds in the private mm -hmm. sector to focus on the solutions we need. We could do the same thing for climate change right now. Mm -hmm. The reason we're not doing it is because the incubation period is decades rather than weeks. And so in a set of narratives that seem to only serve the interests of the boomer CEOs who are pushing them and are directly against the interests of their own younger employees who are getting you know, paid the least and are most at the risk of the consequences of inaction, we're seeing, you know, sort of a system that is reacting to the short term crisis by saying we need government to lead. All right. You know, so it's that, you know, that's that's you know, government action, aggressive role. And then when it comes to the long term one that's decades out, it's sort of like, well, you guys get, you know, Gen Z gets new liberal nonsense, even though, again, it's it's not what our experts are saying. And, and you know, someone won a Nobel Prize for saying that, you know, we need a carbon tax right years ago. Larry Fink in the last week or two, as reported by the Wall Street Journal, was arguing on the sidelines of COP26 yeah. that we shouldn't be pushing for a carbon tax. I mean, this kind of doublespeak is it makes it impossible for people in my generation to eventually get out there and solve this problem because the very system right. we need right. to build and scale innovations, capitalism, is going to lose its political foundation because, you know, again, the majority of people younger than me don't believe in it because they're saying yeah. blah, blah, blah.